In this video, I'll talk about solutions and solubility. First, let's watch this video. And when we talk about solutions, there are two main parts to a solution. We have the solvent and we have the solute. Take for example some salt water, a homogeneous mixture or a solution of salt water. So in this picture here we have a beaker of water and right here we have a pile or a little mound of salt. It can be any salt but for this purpose of this uh, example here we'll use good old-fashioned table salt. Alright so we have some water here and we have some salt here and what we're going to do with this salt is we're going to put it in this beaker here and we're going to stir it up right we're going to stir it up and make a solution of salt water. Alright so eventually we are going to have a solution of salt water and it's going to be nice and evenly mixed so that way uh, a sample of the salt water solution here will be identical to a sample of the salt water solution here alright so the two main parts of a solution are the solvent and the solute so which of these two would be the solvent and which of these two would be the solute well the solvent people would be the water okay the H2O here is going to be your solvent the solvent is the thing that is doing the dissolving. You can think of it that way. The solvent is also the substance that is present in the greatest quantity. That leaves this salt here, the NaCl that we're putting in here in this solution of salt water, is going to be your solute. The solute is typically the substance in a solution that is present in the smallest quantity. And you can think of the solute as the substance that is being dissolved. So in this little solution of salt water here, we have the solvent, which is water, and the solute, which in this case would be the table salt. If I were going to make a solution of sugar water, the water once again would be the solvent, and the sugar would be the solute. And in this unit, we are going to be dealing with solutions in which water is the solvent. And what do we call a solution in which water is the solvent? Well, whenever we have a solution in which water is the solvent, we will have what is known as an aqueous solution. Okay, and when, whenever we have an, an aqueous solution, H2O is always the solvent. So, for example, this solution here would be an aqueous solution of salt water. All right, and in this chapter or in this unit, we are going to be dealing with aqueous solutions, solutions in which the solvent is always going to be water. When we talk about solutions, solutions can either be unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated. So what is the difference between each one of these? Well, let's take a look at what an unsaturated solution is. We have three beakers that are sitting here. In this first one here, we have uh, an unsaturated solution. In the second one, we're going to end up having a saturated solution. And in this third one here, we're going to end up having a supersaturated solution. So what is an unsaturated solution? In an unsaturated solution, we've got a solution that has not quite reached its saturation point. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's suppose I have some salt here in this little salt shaker. And we shake out just a little bit of salt in here. And we go ahead and we stir it up, right? We're going to stir this salt up, right? Well, it hasn't quite reached the total amount of solute that can be dissolved in it. It is considered to be unsaturated. If I wanted to, I can still continue to add more and more salt and stir this little solution up, and the salt will dissolve in it no problem. All right, so an unsaturated solution is a solution in which you can still add more solute to the solution and continue to dissolve it more. In a saturated solution, we have a solution in which the solution has reached its its limit of the amount of stuff that can be dissolved in it. So let's suppose I continue to shake and shake and shake more and more and more and more salt out of this salt shaker. I keep stirring it, I keep stirring it, and I keep stirring it, and it keeps dissolving and it keeps dissolving. Well there will become a point at which no more salt can dissolve in this solution no matter how much we stir it, no matter how, uh, how much uh, we break apart the salt crystals into uh, into smaller little crystals, there's going to be a limit to the amount of salt that can be dissolved in this little beaker of water here. And eventually what's going to end up happening is we're going to have a pile of salt that will begin to develop at the bottom of this little beaker right here. Okay. In this example here, we will have a saturated solution. The solution has reached the limit of the amount of solute that can be dissolved in it. 
All right, so that is what a saturated solution is. In a super saturated solution, here's what we end up having. We take a beaker of water, and what we're going to do is we're going to raise the temperature of this water. So we're going to increase the temperature of this water while we're dissolving more and more salt in here. So we're going to continue to dissolve more and more salt. And in fact, as we'll learn later on in this unit, as you increase the temperature of a solution or the solvent, you can in fact dissolve more and more solute. So by raising the temperature of this, uh, of this solution here, or of this solvent here, we're going to be able to dissolve more and more and more, way more solute than we did over here into this solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue dissolving more and more and more of this salt in this beaker of water right here. Uh, as we continue to raise the temperature and then what we're going to do is we're going to end up cooling the temperature we're going to end up cooling the temperature of this solution okay so at first we're going to start to raise the temperature we're going to add a ton of this salt or solute to this solution and then we're going to cool this solution down and what ends up happening is you have a tremendous amount of solute dissolved in this solution here and uh, as you cool the uh, solution down, what ends up happening if you add more and more of this salt to it is that the solution, uh, the salt ends up falling out of the solution or the salt will end up precipitating out of the solution and what we'll end up having is a bunch of crystals that will ultimately end up forming just like we see right here. Alright, so unsaturated solutions haven't quite reached the limit of the amount of solute that can be dissolved in them. In a saturated solution, you have reached the limit of the amount of solute that can be dissolved in the solution and you'll typically see this pile up at the bottom kind of like an old bowl or uh, not an old bowl but a bowl of Cheerios that you're going to eat right you pile on the sugar or uh, or some cornflakes you pile on the sugar and what's left over a saturated solution of milk and sugar at the bottom right and over here we have a super saturated solution right we've got a solution in which we've raised its temperature we've we're able to dissolve a, a lot more salt than we normally could have and then we end up cooling the temperature down and what ends up happening is that if you continue to add more at that cooler temperature the uh, the solute might precipitate out and form some sort of crystal structure in that little beaker all right so there is unsaturated versus saturated versus super saturated so let's now talk about factors that can affect the rate of dissolution what does this word mean right here, dissolution? Well, you can just think of this word right here as the same thing as dissolving. So we want to look at factors that affect the rate of dissolving a solute in a solvent. So we have a beaker of water right here. Here's my beaker of H2O. And we have a sugar cube right here. If I simply place this sugar cube in this water right here, it's going to float to the bottom. It's going to float to the bottom here because it's more dense than water and it's just going to sit there right it might be quite some time before this sugar cube ends up dissolving but what can I do to speed up the rate of dissolving this sugar cube in this water here where there are three factors that affect the rate of dissolving a solid solute in a liquid solvent okay what are those three factors well let's take a look what I can do is I can take a hammer to this sugar cube here I can smash it all up into this pile right here and basically what I've done is I've increased the surface area so the first thing I could do is I can increase the surface area of the sugar and now if I take this and I dump it in this beaker right here it's gonna have a, a lot better time or a, a, a lot better ability to dissolve in this water right here right so what's the second thing I can do to increase the rate of dissolving I can take this little stir rod right here and stir up this solution right if I stir up the solution from prior experience we know that this sugar will dissolve in this water right if you get a glass of tea at a restaurant and you ask for some sugar packets just dumping those sugar packets in there isn't gonna really do much but if you grab a spoon and start stirring that mixture up you'll notice that that sugar is going to dissolve so a second way that we can increase the rate of dissolving a solid solute in a liquid solvent would be to stir it and third and finally what we can do is put a little flame under here we can heat this solution up right if we heat this solution up this sugar in this uh, solution of sugar water is going to have 
a lot easier time dissolving. So increasing the temperature, increasing the temperature. will increase the rate at which this sugar will dissolve. Let's get back to the document. Uh, we'll look at this table first. There are three different types of solutions, gaseous solution, liquid solution, or solid solution. So in a gaseous solution, you have a gas dissolving gas. In a liquid solution, you can have gas liquid or solid being dissolved in a liquid. What about solid solution, both the solvent and the solute? or solids. So again, uh, if you have a gaseous liquid or solid solution, solvent is gas, liquid, or solid. And then in this liquid solvent, you can dissolve gas, liquid, or solid. So uh, let me give you some examples. How can we dissolve gas into gas? Well, that's the easiest thing in the world. For example, air. Air is simply oxygen being dissolved in nitrogen. And also, there's CO2, water vapor, and uh, argon being dissolved in nitrogen gas. Or actually, any gas mixture is a gaseous solution. And usually, uh, the chemical with larger amount is considered as the solvent. The smaller amount is solute. We can also dissolve gas in a liquid, for example, carbonated water or club soda, or this is uh, commonly used in chemistry labs, HCl solution. HCl, hydrogen chloride, is a gas at the room temperature, but we can dissolve this gas a large amount of HCl in water, form HCl solution, and this is also called a hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. And then we can dissolve liquid in liquid, for example, acetic acid, uh, dissolved in water, it's called the aqueous solution of acetic acid. And then sulfuric acid is usually a solution. Uh, you have uh, two chemicals in the sulfuric acid. One is water, the other one is H2SO4. Uh, finally, solid can also be dissolved in liquid. You know that we can dissolve table salt in water, we can dissolve sodium hydroxide in water. This is a basic solution. We can dissolve some other salts in water like potassium nitrite, potassium chloride, ammonium nitrite. So usually nitrite salt can be dissolved in water. Uh, solid in solid, um, a good example is brass and any other alloy is a solid solution. So one metal can be dissolved in another metal. So in the end, what's really the definition of solution. It's just homogeneous mixture. That's it. As long as you see a homogeneous mixture, it's a solution. It can be a gas or liquid or solid. Uh, to form a solution, one must mix the solute and solvent together uh, in a homogeneous manner. That means uh, each solute is going to be surrounded by some solvent molecules and each solvent um, will also be surrounded by, you know, at least some solid molecules. Uh, that also means we need to kind of break apart some solid molecules and also break apart some solvent molecules. For example, if we dissolve sodium chloride in water, we have to separate this sodium plus from chlorine minus. That takes energy. We will also have to uh, move water molecules away from each other to create some space to accommodate the sodium plus and chlorine minus. That also requires energy. Why? Because you will have to break some hydrogen bonds between water molecules to create some space for the sodium plus and chlorine minus ions. So again, that requires energy. But when you put this uh, sodium plus and chlorine minus in water, there's going to be some attraction between sodium plus and water, chlorine minus and water. It's called ion dipole attraction. So that attraction uh, releases energy when forming the solution. So when you form a solution, two things are going on. So one, you're trying to overcome the attraction between solute molecules. You're trying to overcome the attraction between the solvent molecules. And that step requires energy. And two, 
there's going to be attraction between solute and solvent molecules. That part releases energy. And this is very important. So we have to compare this uh, to different steps and see if overall the dissolution of the solute releases energy or uh, requires energy. If the dissolution requires energy, it's called endothermic. If the dissolution releases energy, it's called exothermic. And if we mix two chemicals and the mixing releases energy, a solution will be formed. Uh, it's, uh, the dissolution is favored energetically. All right. So one example is um, uh, if you dissolve sulfuric acid in water, uh, a significant amount of heat is going to be released. Uh, now, if the mixing of two chemicals is neither endothermic nor exothermic, so uh, we're not uh, concerned about the energy change. For example, the mixing of helium and neon, both are noble gas atoms, and there's uh, uh, negligible attraction between those gases. And between two helium atoms or between two neon atoms, there's negligible attraction. Uh, if we mix these two gases, a uh, solution will also be formed. And uh, obviously, it's not because of the uh, energy decrease. It's something else. It's called increase of entropy. Uh, what is entropy? Entropy is uh, simply the randomness of the system. So if you mix pure helium and pure neon, uh, you increase uh, the, I'm sorry, the randomness of the system increases. All right? <clears throat> uh, in general, gases always mix with each other. Just any two gases, put them together, they will mix. All right? It's impossible for just, you know, one gas to stay away from the other gas. That's impossible. So, if, again, if you just put two gases together, they're going to mix because of the increase of the randomness of the system, or you can say entropy. All right. Sometimes when you mix two chemicals, uh, the mixing is endothermic. That means uh, the mixing requires energy. And then um, whether a solution will be formed depends on two things. One, how much energy is required. Okay, we know it's endothermic, so energy is required. So how much? And two, how much this system is going to be randomized uh, during this uh, dissolution process, All right? So um, we have to compare two thermodynamic functions, the change of the enthalpy of the system. So this is uh, related to heat in an isobaric process. Anyway, we always uh, dissolve things under isobaric condition. Really, we use isochoric condition. So this delta H is the change of enthalpy of the system. This is uh, equivalent to the heat flows into the system under isobaric condition, delta H. Uh, and we need to compare this delta H with T delta S. T is the temperature. Uh, delta S is the change of the entropy or the change of the randomness. So when you mix things, the randomness increases. The system becomes more random, and the entropy thus increases. Right? So we need to compare these two things. Uh, in this case, endothermic, that means delta H is positive, and T delta S is always positive. Why? Temperature is always positive. And when you are mixing things, delta S, the um, change of entropy always increases because you are increasing the randomness of the system by mixing stuff. All right? Well, of course, if you separate helium from neon, uh, the entropy decreases. So let's compare delta H and T delta S. If delta H is less than T delta S, okay, both are positive, okay? This is endothermic, therefore delta H is positive, T is positive, delta S mixing is positive, so uh, delta H is positive, T delta S is positive. So we're just comparing which one is bigger, all right? If T delta S is bigger than delta H, then solution is going to be formed. If delta H is bigger, then solution is not going to be formed. All right, so two factors. One is uh, the energetic factor, 
we look at the energy change. And two, entropic uh, effect or factor. We're looking at the change of the entropy. So we compare this two. Temperature is also a factor too. So probably we can tell that by just looking at this term, usually at higher temperature, you have a larger T delta S and more likely the solution is gonna be formed. Uh, there's a rule of thumb regarding whether two chemicals mix mix with each other. Uh, this rule is called like dissolves like. So usually if you have two similar chemicals, they are usually miscible with each other. For example, water and methanol. So water is uh, HOH, methanol is CH3OH. So uh, it's just the only difference is uh, in water, it's HOH. In methanol, it's this is called a methyl group, methyl OH. So that's the only difference. And uh, the hydrogen atom and this CH3 functional group behave similarly. Uh, therefore, this water and methanol are considered having similar structures. Therefore, they are miscible. Water and ethanol are also miscible. For example, vodka. Uh, miscible means uh, two chemicals mix in all proportions. So you can put 1% water in 99% methanol, it's soluble. You can put actually 1% methanol into 99% water, it's miscible. Or you can do 50-50, it's still miscible. If you, if you do 40-60, uh, 60-40, 30-70, they are just all mixed perfectly. That's called a miscible. Miscible means just in all proportions, the two chemicals mix. All right, and then another example, uh, these two uh, are miscible. So this is uh, uh, so-called uh, a hexane. This is uh, so-called hepten. Uh, hexane means uh, six carbons, hepten means um, seven carbons. So they are just uh, carbon chains. Let's say, look at these two uh, similar um, hydrocarbon molecules or alkenes. Uh, if you're gonna take organic chemistry, they are alkenes carbon-6 and carbon-7 alkanes, they have similar structures, and therefore they are miscible. All right, uh, the reason uh, this uh, like dissolves like rule um, is very useful. It works maybe 90% of the time. It's because uh, if you have two chemicals similar to each other, then delta H is usually zero. All right, this is because the attraction between uh, two, um, this, this is called hexane, between two hexane, and the attraction between two hepten is similar to the attraction between a hexen and a hepten. All right, so uh, in short, the carbon six, carbon six attraction is equal to carbon seven, carbon seven attraction. It's equal to carbon six, carbon seven attraction. So by mixing this two, uh, there's no net change in the enthalpy of the system. So delta H is roughly zero. And then temperature is always positive, and if you're mixing stuff, the randomness increases, delta S is positive. So we are comparing this delta H, which is roughly zero, and this positive T delta S. And this T delta S always wins in this situation. Therefore, like dissolves like. Similarly, between water and methanol, the attraction is about the same before and after mixing. So delta H is roughly zero. However, again, if you mix water and methanol, the randomness of the system increases, the entropy increases, and temperature times uh, delta S is gonna be positive, and delta H is roughly zero or negligible, and then uh, this inequality holds, all right? So that's why uh, water and methanol are miscible. Uh, one last example. This, uh, again, this is uh, called hexane. H-E-X-A-N-E, -E. it's just a linear hydrocarbon chain, and water, they're not soluble in each other. In this case, it's because delta H is greater than T delta S, all right? So first, to mix this uh, hexane and water, you need to break um, the um, hexane molecules apart. You need to overcome the dispersion between hepto molecules. Uh, I'm sorry, hexane molecules. And for water, you need to uh, break the attraction between water molecules. It's called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is uh, the strongest dipole-dipole interaction. 
okay, or at least one of the strongest dipole-dipole interactions. So uh, it takes a lot of energy. And then if you put a water and a hexane close to each other, yes, there's going to be some attraction between these two molecules, but the attraction between hexane and water is much smaller than the attraction between water and water and between uh, hexane and hexane. All right. So uh, in general, uh, let's say um, we have two different kind of molecules, A and B. So A and A attract each other. B and B attract each other very strongly. So A really likes to be surrounded by A. B really likes to be surrounded by B. And A, B, well, there's no not much chemistry between A and B. And if you force this A and B to be mixed, well, they don't like it. All right, so it takes a lot of energy to uh, uh, force this uh, hexane and water to be uh, mixed. And this delta H is really large. You need a lot of energy to overcome the attraction between the, um, the hexane molecules. And also you need a lot of energy to overcome the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. And that's why this delta H is very large. And when this delta H is very large, it's going to be greater than T times delta S, temperature times the increase of entropy, all right? And in this case, these two chemicals are not soluble with each other. However, if you look at this uh, inequality, you may think maybe if I increase the temperature high enough, maybe they will be uh, slightly soluble in each other. And if you think about that, you're correct. So that's why at higher temperature you can actually use hot water to dissolve a bit a little bit more oil for that reason and if you wash dishes I mean and okay without um, any soap uh, dishwashing liquid I think if you use hot water it's easier to wash off the oil now practice problems uh, three of them uh, we're gonna talk about this um, so first, are uh, O2 and HCl miscible? That's the first question. Second question, this uh, calcium carbonate does not dissolve in water. Uh, if you use a humidifier in your room and sometimes you see uh, the formation of some white solid or white precipitate, it's usually calcium uh, carbonate or magnesium carbonate. All right. Um, it does not dissolve in water. So uh, what can you say about this delta H and T delta S? All right, and then uh, problem three. Uh, dissolving this compound, it's called ammonium nitrate in water. Uh, this dissolution of ammonium nitrate in water requires energy, so it's endothermic. Um, but it still proceeds fairly well. So the solubility of this compound in water is good. So why? Uh, you may pause here. I'm about to talk about the uh, the answers to those three questions. So first, are O2 and HCl miscible? So first, this HCl is a gas at the room temperature, right? This is different from hydrochloric acid. This is just hydrogen chloride. So we call this hydrogen chloride. It's a gas. After you dissolve hydrogen chloride in water, it's called hydrochloric acid. It's a solution, all right? So we're talking about this gas here. And this O2 is a gas at the room temperature. And this is nonpolar, this is polar, and they are miscible, actually. And why is that? The only reason is simple. Uh, they are just gases. Gases always mix with each other. Uh, the reason is gas molecules are usually far away from each other. Uh, the distance between gas particles is is usually 10 times greater than the distance between liquid molecules or solid molecules, so 10 times. What about the attraction? Attraction is inversely proportional to um, the distance to the power of 3, roughly. Okay, so if you're talking about the attraction between two water molecules in, in liquid water, that's roughly 20 kJ per mole, but in the gas phase, it's going to be 20 kJ per mole divided by 1,000, all right, because the, the distance is tenfold. And then the attraction is um, only 10 to the power of negative 3. So very small attraction between even two water molecules in the gas phase. How about this too? Again, the uh, attraction between the two molecules is negligible. So it's neither endothermic nor exothermic. 
when mixing two gases. So the en entropic effect is important. And whenever you mix uh, things, two gases, the entropy increases. If you mix two liquids, the entropy increases. Even if you mix two um, solids, okay, um, I should not use this uh, as an example. It's not like you put in sand and, and iron together. You have to kind of melt them and then um, dissolve one in the other. But let's get back to the gas. When you mix two gases, uh, entropy goes up. So we have a positive change of entropy times temperature. It's positive, And this delta H is roughly zero. So we can tell that the zero is smaller than a positive number. So gases always mix with each other. Problem two. Uh, calcium carbonate does not, not dissolve in, in water. And uh, what can you say about delta H and T delta S? Uh, so if it does not dissolve in water, we can know this for sure. Delta H is greater than T delta S. All right, that's, it's always true. So if A does not dissolve in B, that means the dissolution involves the change of H and the change of S, and delta H is greater than T delta S if A does not dissolve in B. So that's it, very simple. So delta H is greater than T delta S. And also, we know that uh, if you mix two things, delta S is always positive, and therefore this term T delta S is positive. And delta H is greater than a positive number, so delta H is positive. This is endothermic. Delta H is positive, and it's not just greater than zero, it's also greater than T delta S. All right, so over here, so we know this two things. Finally, dissolution of ammonium nitrate in water requires energy. It's also endothermic. Delta H is greater than zero. But in this case, it still proceeds. That means uh, uh, this uh, chemical dissolves in water very well at the room temperature. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. This time, delta H is positive. However, T delta S is more positive. That's it. All right, so uh, this delta H is positive. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to kind of just uh, replace this. All right, the dissolution of ammonium nitrate in water is endothermic, that means delta H is positive, but T, the temperature times the change of entropy is even more positive. And that's why this uh, ammonium nitrate is soluble in water. So in the end, um, whether A dissolves in B, depends on two factors. One is the change of enthalpy. One is the change of entropy, this uh, delta S times temperature. All right, so um, this part is always positive. T times delta S is always positive. So if delta H is negative, and then, well, it's always soluble. When delta H is zero, it's always soluble because uh, T delta S is positive. So. As long as delta H is smaller than T delta S, it's soluble. So when does A not mix with B? Okay, two conditions. First, it has to be endothermic. Delta H has to be greater than zero. And two, not only delta H has to be greater than zero, delta H has to be greater than temperature times the change of entropy here. All right.